The vast majority of green screen you've seen in your life, you probably haven't even noticed. Because green screen doesn't suck. You probably just suck at green screen. In this episode of Film Science, we break down the fundamentals of shooting for green screen and why sometimes it looks so bad. I spent years avoiding learning how to chroma key because I thought it wasn't possible to do well without specializing in VFX. I was mostly wrong. By understanding the principles of how to actually shoot for chroma key, it can be a wildly powerful tool. And we've used it for a bunch of launch videos and commercials we couldn't have created otherwise. Chroma keying is a multi-step journey and there are ample opportunities to make mistakes you pay for in the final product. In our experience, very few of these problems are caused in post. They're usually shortcuts or mistakes we've made in planning and shooting. When it comes to shooting green screen, there are five things you have to get right. Number one, framing and composition. We've talked about it before, but the human eye is incredibly complex, with a bunch of adaptations that allow us to see in low light and interpret the three-dimensional world around us. But this does mean it can be hard to trick. In every scene and surrounding, we can interpret a vanishing point, helping us determine orientation and proximity. This becomes super important when replacing backgrounds or elements in a scene, because the framing and perspective have to match. So let's test it out. We headed outside to the beach with relatively consistent natural lighting so we could isolate the effect of just the back plate perspective. If we have our front and back plate perfectly lined up, it looks pretty good. But as soon as we move the camera on our front plate more than a few degrees, we start to notice the perspective on the subject is no longer correct and it looks a bit like a zoom background. This also happens with focal length if we change the distance and even things like aperture. For a shot that doesn't look like green screen, we want to match our perspective as close as possible. Once you have your frame and everything lines up, the next biggest giveaway of bad green screen is the lighting not matching. While it's less immediate than the perspective being wrong, it feels unnatural, a bit weird, and makes it clear that the subject doesn't belong in the environment. Let's test this in our studio. When we set everything up consistently, the scene composes back together. But when we switch our light's direction, it starts to look wrong. The sources of the back plate don't match the sources on our subject. Even if it's something a bit more minor, like the tint of the light, the harshness, or even just a missing hair light, you can see the difference. But what if knowing isn't enough? Certain light is hard to replicate, especially outdoors. The sun is an enormous, incredibly powerful source that's far away and effectively has parallel rays. This gives almost no fall off, is very soft when diffused by clouds or the environment, and produces shadows that have a particular natural look. One that isn't always possible to perfectly replicate in a studio. Unless of course you have an aircraft hangar full of light panels, but then you probably wouldn't be watching this video. The way we can get around this is to use green screen to only substitute part of a real environment, in the case of set extensions, or to film our shot in an outdoor environment that matches the finished location as close as possible. Thinking about sun position and orientation, weather conditions and ambient light color will help you match these two environments. But in practice, we don't do a lot of green screen where we're replacing full environments. It's way more common for us to use it as a tool in a scene where we're replacing one element, or we need control of an element that would be too hard to rotoscope. Which leads us to number three, the screen itself. It's not essential that the screen is a particular green. Some productions use blue, and Disney even used to use these yellow screens in a sodium vapor process. You just need to make sure that the color isn't dominant in your subject. What really matters is that the screen represents as small a band of values as possible. If we have a wide range of values in our screen, it can be difficult for the chroma key process to distinguish whether something is the green screen or a semi-transparent object in front of the screen, like hair or glass. Some poor green screen is easy to notice because hair or semi-transparent objects start to clip and disappear in a noticeable and inconsistent way. The variation can be caused by shadows, wrinkles, an unevenly lit green screen, or even noise if you're shooting at a really high ISO. Using false color on your monitor will help with positioning lights to minimize any gradients, but it helps to start with a screen that is as smooth and even as possible. Using a high quality green screen can help here, like the ones we're giving away on the blog. Check out the link in the description below. But the second thing to keep in mind is spill. Light bounces off objects in your scene, reflecting the color of an object onto anything around it. This becomes a bit of a problem when you have a giant fluoro green plane you want to pretend isn't there. Any spill from the screen can illuminate the edges and shadows of your object green, or the color of the screen, and remain in your final shot. While some despilling is a part of the keying process, you want to minimize spill when you shoot for a quality key later. Keep your green screen as far from the talent as is realistic, and don't use a screen that is too big. You only need it to cover your talent, not the full frame. 
So you've got everything set up. The final thing to think about is your compression settings. To make your footage playable and save space, the camera can do a bunch of compression before it saves it to the card. However, the method of compression can interfere with chroma keying. Now we did a whole video on the science of log versus raw, but what we didn't get into was 422 versus 444 footage. In 444 footage, the camera records a luminance and two chroma values for every pixel, giving the highest resolution video possible. But to save space in 422 footage, the camera averages the two chroma channels. This is pretty imperceivable in casual viewing, but the blended color information reduces color resolution, resulting in a blockier, lower quality key. While it's not essential, if possible, you'll want to shoot at 444 at a high bitrate for this reason. With all those factors in mind, we really need to go back to the beginning, because the biggest mistake you can make in chroma keying is failing to plan your shot. It's kind of like the French culinary concept of mise en place. By knowing the recipe or process, deciding on the variables, and having your ingredients together before you start, you're going to end up with a much better final shot. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and picked up something that will help with your process. If you have any further tips we didn't cover, leave them in the comments below. We'll catch you later.